to the Chronicles of Aguna, the Arsenal podcast powered by loserpool.com. I'm your host, Harry Simiou, but tonight, this week, I should say even, I'm flying solo. Got home late from work, um, unfortunately was kept back uh, because of a stupid mistake on somebody else's part. I ended up staying very late as a result. My guests could not make it, um, which is no fault of their own. It's my fault because I booked them in. And then I fucked up, basically. Got stuck at work, and then so you're stuck with me and me alone. Um, but anyway, I'll have to do for this week. Let's look back at the 2-1 victory over Bournemouth. Um, and I want to start off by running through the starting 11. Uh, Unai Emery's initial team selection certainly caught many people off guard. Uh, he decided to switch things up defensively, brought Socrates back into the side and ended up starting with a back three. Bellerin and Kalasinac were asked to play as wing backs. Um, so a change in formation there. Not sure why that was. Um, he's spoken a lot about the threats that Bournemouth offered and, and that he was concerned. A part of me thinks that maybe it's because he, he didn't trust um Bellerin and Kalasinac defensively in a back four, and that's why he went that way. Um, it could be that, you know, Bournemouth normally start with a front two, uh, particularly now that Josh King is back, and and maybe he, that was the reason behind it. Maybe that was his thinking. Uh, Xhaka and Torreira were deployed in front of the back line with Mikitari and Annie Wobi ahead of them. And then Pierre-Emerick Aubameyang was leading the line in the absence of Lacazette. Uh, of course, there was no place in the starting eleven for Mesa Ozil. Now, Unai was asked to explain the Germans' omission from the team post-match and told the media that he felt he needed a side that could cope with the physicality and intensity of Bournemouth. And I suppose that makes sense, doesn't it? I mean, you could argue that the managers left out our greatest creative influence, but when you think about it, if it's about physicality, and intensity alone, then that decision was probably justified. I guess the point here is that Emery, looking at this fixture in isolation, felt he needed to be combative and competitive, and that was key. And although Mikitarian didn't play well on the day, Emery probably felt that he could contribute with some creativity of his own at least. Um, you know, let's be honest, it's not really a big deal, is it? For years we've complained our manager was unwilling to adapt to our opponent and now we have somebody willing to do exactly that without any consideration for player reputations or anything like that without giving a shit whether or not he leaves out our highest paid player it's all about what's best for the team and, and that's refreshing to see the media will always make a big deal out of things like that why it's probably due to a, a lack of imagination to be honest it's lazy in many ways isn't it Yes, it's worth highlighting, but it doesn't mean we need to be speaking about it days after the event has passed. Now, as previously mentioned, Alexander Lacazette was ruled out with a groin problem. He's said to have pulled up the day before this fixture with a slight injury of which the extent has not yet been revealed. I'm certainly hoping the decision to leave him behind was precautionary because despite Aubameyang being the match winner on Sunday, I just feel as though Lacazette offers more in that central striking position. I think he gets far more involved in games. He links up with the midfield better. I think he's more comfortable playing with his back to goal than his colleague and chips in with a fair amount of goals himself. Um, I just think we're a far better side with Lacazette in the starting eleven than we are without him for 
all the reasons I've just mentioned. And with our next two league fixtures being the, the North London derby, followed by a trip to Old Trafford, I'm desperate to see him recover quickly. Now, in my preview of the Bournemouth game, I said I expected them to line up in more of a 4-4-1-1 formation as opposed to the 4-4-2 that they actually started the game with. But that was because I didn't feel Josh King would be rushed back into the side, having just recovered from a lengthy injury. Now, I was wrong. The Norwegian forward was thrown straight back into the mix, and particularly in the early stages of the game. The Cherries front pair worked our central defenders tirelessly, causing us a whole host of problems. They're both sharp, pacey, very strong physically, and you can see why they've been so effective in this division. As well as all of that, both Wilson and King are always willing to run the channels, and that's certainly what they were instructed to do, often pulling Mustafi and holding out of position and subsequently dragging Socrates out as a result, creating space in the inside channels for the likes of Brooks and Fraser to step inside and attack the penalty area at will. Now, the best example of that was the two times David Brooks managed to wriggle free in the first half. The first of which he scored and had his effort chalked off by the linesman incorrectly, it has to be said. Uh, having watched the game on Sky Sports, I think when they initially showed the replay, they froze the screen at the wrong point. I think the ball was kicked against the forward as opposed to him playing it into Brooks. And that slight difference in timing meant the 21-year-old was actually onside. I thought so anyway, but I've not seen it back many times. I've got to be honest um, at the time of recording. And then there was the second time when he forced a good save from Bernd Leno. So prime example of how Bournemouth were keen to drag those two centre-halves, the, the two playing either side of Socrates, out wide. Um exposing the gaps behind Kalasinac and behind Bellerin and, and subsequently creating space inside for their inverted wingers, it should be said, to cut inside. Uh, if truth be told, I thought Arsenal were poor right up until Jefferson Lerma scored that spectacular own goal on the half hour mark. A huge slice of fortune in our favour, but you know what? We'll take it. So, Having broken the deadlock in such fortuitous fashion, you can imagine my frustrations when right on the stroke of halftime, we conceded such a cheap and soft goal. I mean, how naive can you be? I've had a few listeners of late giving me a hard time uh, on here and over at the same old Arsenal when I've criticised certain tactical decisions or suggested that perhaps we aren't as far down the progression line as some of us would like to believe. Well, the goal we conceded at the weekend proves that we're just as naive, just as fragile and just as susceptible to the counter-attack as we've always been. I'm not looking for reasons to dig out Unai Emery. He's the manager of Arsenal Football Club. I want him to be successful, but that doesn't mean he's exempt from criticism. Just like Xhaka isn't or Bellerin or Mustafi for that matter. However, for me, there are some cert there are some obvious, I should say, defensive flaws in his tactical approach. The fullbacks or wingbacks are encouraged to get forward, which is great, but there simply isn't sufficient cover provided to them by the rest of the team. He's got to address that. He's got to find a way of better protecting certain areas on the pitch. Arsenal are a team in transition, a team developing. Unai Emery's developing too. All managers are developing throughout their careers, but just because it's his first season at Arsenal and we so desperately wanted change, that does not mean he's perfect and that I'm being negative if I criticise him. Nobody's perfect. He can learn. I can learn. You can learn. We can all learn. Um, so, yeah, I, I just wanted to make that point because I've, I've received all sorts of messages this past couple of weeks when I've highlighted things I believe to be tactical weaknesses or, or tactical faults. Now, if you cast your mind back to that goal that we conceded, Alex Iwobi lost possession in the Bournemouth penalty area. The cherries broke. Bellerin was probably caught slightly too far up the pitch. But for me, the worst part about it and my biggest annoyance was the, the time Callum Wilson was afforded to receive the ball, step inside the pitch completely unchallenged and play the pass inside. I mean, what on earth was Shkod Ram Mustafi doing? Get out to him, close him down, put him under pressure. Those are the basics, the bare minimum a defender should be doing in that situation. Now, to a degree, I understand that as one of the three central defenders, you don't want to be pulled out to the touchline. And it goes back to that point I made earlier on about 
Bournemouth intentionally trying to lure Holding and Mustafi into doing that. So I get why he was hesitant to go there. But in that situation, when you're short of numbers, caught on the break, you need to do it. You've got to. You've got to at least put him under some sort of pressure. Um, and, and you know, that just didn't happen. Again, I've already mentioned it, but Socrates kept having to come over and clean up in the holes Mustafi was leaving behind him. And the Greek international picked up a yellow card as a result of that because he was cleaning up somebody's mess. Um, for me, it wasn't his worst game, Mustafi, but he he needs to improve a great deal. You know, I, I'm still not convinced about him. I've been a huge critic of his and there's no signs of that going away. I just think every time we get exposed, it's because of him or it comes through his channel. There's just, I don't know, he, he just doesn't sit right with me at the moment. Lauren Koscielny, of course, is set to feature for the under-23s this week and the sooner he can get back to match fitness, the better. Now, in the aftermath of Sunday's game, I've read lots of tweets, blogs, etc., etc., suggesting that Alex Iwobi was to blame for losing possession in the first place. But my view on it is that that's an extremely harsh stance to take. He's tried to turn um, or do a piece of skill in the opposition's penalty area, but that is the place to do it, isn't it? I mean, had he done that on the edge of his own box, fair enough, point the finger at him. But if you can't try that sort of thing, in the opposition's penalty area, where can you try it? And, and there's no excuse for letting a team go right up the other end of the pitch and score like that. Especially when, in my opinion, the build-up wasn't anything special. I mean, it wasn't, was it? It was just far too easy for Eddie Howe's men. And for me, blaming Iwobi is nonsensical and, and just harsh. I, I just, I don't get that. Um, if you disagree, tweet me at Chronicles underscore AFC. I'd love to hear why you feel it's okay for a defence to be pulled to pieces like that, for midfielders to not track back. But it's not okay for Alex Iwobi to try a bit of skill in the opposition penalty area. Just my thoughts in it. I'd love to hear what you guys think. Let me know. Um, but despite how poorly I felt we defended in the lead up to that goal, you've got to give Josh King immense credit. The finish was exquisite and left Bern Leno with absolutely no chance whatsoever. Now, Pierre-Emerick Aubameyang turned out to be the match winner when he scored from close range on the 67th minute. And that goal put him joint top of the Premier League scoring chart alongside Sergio Aguero on eight goals. Harry Kane, eat your heart out. Probably not the best thing to be saying uh, during North London Derby Week. But anyway... Um We'll, we'll shift our attention to that later on in the week. But that's pretty remarkable, isn't it? When you think about how many games Aubameyang started from the bench, particularly earlier on in the season, um, it's incredible that he scored eight goals and that he's joined top alongside Sergio Aguero, who's playing in a Manchester City side that literally just score at will. Um, on average, Aubameyang has scored every 118 minutes. And 52% of his attempts at goal have been on target this season. Pretty good statistics. Now, his contribution was telling in the end, but in truth, he didn't contribute all that much else during the game. And, and he does go through large periods of every game he plays on the periphery of things. Um, I'm still not all that convinced he's effective enough when he plays as the lone striker. And I certainly don't think he's any better when he operates from the left. But then I look at his goal record and I think, does it even matter? Um, am I being overly picky? Maybe it's just a little bit of frustration because I feel that there's so much more to come from this player. Um, I don't know. Let me know what you think. Again, tweet me at Chronicles underscore AFC. Be happy to respond uh, to any comments or questions, of course. Now, as I've already mentioned, small matter of the North London derby coming up uh, this week weekend we will be doing a preview show for that of course we will um so stay tuned for that that'll be out on thursday um as we look ahead to that one and i must admit i'm a little bit nervous going into these next two fixtures because obviously with spurs it's a derby and you're always um afraid of losing i think afraid is the right term more than anything you don't want your rivals to have the bragging rights and particularly this season where it looks as though you know, we're going to have to perform out of our skins to, to reach the Champions League promised land that we so desperately crave to be back in. It, this derby is very important, as are all derbies, but 
for me, this next two fixtures feel like do or die. It feels like we need to come out of the back of this next little run unscathed and, and still in with a shout because as we've seen in previous years, if our confidence takes a dip, you know, we we do have a tendency of going off the rail. So fingers crossed we get a couple of positive results in the next week or so. Massive, massive 10 days or so coming up uh, for Arsenal Football Club. Uh, guys, thank you once again for listening. There's only so long I can blab on by myself. Um, but yeah, hope you guys have enjoyed the show. And uh, please do follow us on Twitter at Chronicles underscore AFC. This show can be found on the FNX network, iTunes, Acast, uh, Podbean, TuneIn Radio, SoundCloud. Have I already said that one? Can't remember. Anyway, check it out. Subscribe or follow us depending on the platform. We've also got a YouTube channel, um, which we've started uploading our podcasts on just recently. Um, I had a pretty good response on there, but we're looking to up our subscriber numbers so please do head over to youtube subscribe uh tell your friends about it and uh yeah we'll be bringing you more content throughout the season of course with myself and various other guests so thanks again for listening and uh i'll be back on thursday with a tottenham hotspur preview um not really going to talk about poltava to be honest because i think tottenham will take center stage this week won't it no doubt about that Until then, take care, guys.